Welcome back and thank you for joining us for the second day of the Open Source Strategy Forum 2020. Well, I, I really genuinely wish that we were meeting in, the, in person this week and I'm sure many of you do too and probably my kids who would like me out of the house. I hope that you enjoyed the content yesterday and I'm excited to kick off day two. So just before we get started, uh, a few quick reminders. We welcome and encourage you to engage with the community. We've had some great lively conversations over the Slack channels, and, and there you can chat with other attendees and presenters on really a wide range of topics, maybe related to open source and finance, or maybe related to your pets or food, and really anything that helps engage you with the community. And, and we wanna keep this conversation going. So the Slack channels will stay open for a while. You can carry on co having a, the conversations. And we also recommend that you subscribe to our community at finos.org mailing list. And this is just a place where the community provides updates about uh, things that are happening in the foundation. We also hope that you will spread the word through your own networks and social media. And the bigger our community, the more we can do together. And finally, we want everyone to enjoy the event. So please be sure that you follow our code of conduct and treat all of the attendees with respect. You can find the code of conduct in multiple places, including under the information heading at the conference site. And if you encounter any issues or find anything at all concerning, please don't hesitate to contact Trisha Barker or Angela Brown, and you can do this via Slack, direct chat on the conference platform, or even on email. I would also like to give a great big thank you to our sponsors, our leader sponsors, GitLab, IBM, and Red Hat, our contributor sponsor, Tidelift, and our community sponsor, TradeWeb. You know, this wouldn't be possible without you. And attendees, please make sure you stop by their booths, check out what's going on, engage with them in Slack. And we really are very grateful for um, all their support. So let's kick off with today's keynote. Um, yesterday, Gab spoke briefly about the noteworthy progress that our financial services community has made in adopting open source and the value it brings to all participants, both on the technical and, and business side. And today I'm gonna to focus a little more on how the finance industry can build on that and tackle some big challenges. And by way of introduction, I'm uh, Tasha Ellison, the Chief Operating Officer at Finos. Uh, so this morning, we issued a press release announcing that two new projects have been contributed to the foundation and that we've kicked off an important new initiative. Uh, so the first, uh, the Symphony Java Toolkit, has been contributed by Deutsche Bank. And as adoption of Symphony grows, this is an ideal time to collaborate on tools that address common concerns and workflows. And this suite of libraries really does just that. You know, it's been used in production at Deutsche Bank, and it focuses on delivering client functionality, things like request for quote, building orders, sharing acts information. And these are useful utilities that should be developed once collaboratively, not multiple times across multiple firms. You know, doing it once, that means you have more time to focus on the price that's actually in that RFQ or the customer order for your client, really the value add for your firm. And if you didn't catch yesterday's talk, um, it's worth watching the replay to learn more. We also announced that OpenMama has joined Finos. Now, OpenMama is a vendor neutral cross-platform API that interfaces with a wide variety of message-oriented middleware systems. It provides a simplified way of sharing market data across investment banks, proprietary trading companies, hedge funds, and data providers. And if you've ever done an implementation of a market data feed, you know it can be complicated, can take about a lot of time. So, you know, having this common project can help reduce the cost of ownership and the time, and, and the time to market for all of the market participants. Uh, now, OpenMama was already open sourced under the Linux Foundation, but when Finos moved to the Linux Foundation, it made sense to join together where we can jointly benefit from the alignment of um, our members and community. So where is this taking us? You know, we're excited about these contributions and they really highlight part of what has been a great year for us. You know, as Gab and Dove mentioned yesterday, We've had a record number of contributions from banks, and this is a strong indicator that financial services is more fully embracing open source. You know, with this growing community and ecosystem and this greater comfort with open source practices, the finance industry is in prime position to collaborate on bigger opportunities and innovate the open source way. 
And, you know, one of the opportunities we see is in reg tech. You know, we think that there's, that open source software and standards can really change the way that financial regulation is interpreted, implemented, and supervised. And, and that's why we started the Open RegTech Initiative, really to explore and promote opportunities for collaboration between financial, financial institutions, technology firms, service providers, and regulators. Um, I co-lead this initiative for Finnis alongside my, con my colleague, Aitana Miol, and we're thrilled with the interested interest that we've had so far from all of these different market participants. You know, and as a result of that interest, our board has approved the creation of a special interest group focused on this topic. Now, before I get into the, the, a bit more about the special interest group, I wanna give you a, a little bit of a sense for just how big of a challenge this is and why it's important. You know, there are a very large number of financial regulators across the globe. And many financial institutions provide services in a large number of markets. And so they need to address the requirements for those many different regulators. And those regulators might all have different models or different approaches to how they deliver and want to receive information related to the regulations. You know, and these regulations can be very lengthy and dense. For example, Dodd-Frank's regulatory definition of swaps the swabs is 160 pages long. You know, these many millions of pages of regulation ultimately result in the production of billions of data points. Uh, former Bank of England Governor Mark Carney said last year that the bank can receive 65 billion data points in a single year. And there's a reason for this. You know, financial services is an extremely complex and often nuanced industry covering a huge range of products and services delivered to hundreds of millions, and in some case, billions of people. And as you can imagine, with this level of complexity and scale, there's a cost, you know? It's, it's costly, it's expensive to interpret those regulations. One report showed that bank compliance costs jumped more than $50 billion a year after Dodd-Frank, and, and that's before you even get to the implementation. And for each of the regulated entities who has to implement those regulations, there's a technology cost, you know, a systems cost. Uh, LexisNexis recently estimated that 40% of financial crime compliance costs are associated with technology. And then there's the, the expense of making, understanding what all of that data is telling us. You know, but with all of this, it's important that we get regulation and compliance right. Because if we can get it, if we get it wrong, there can be disastrous effects. So with that as a backdrop, I'd like to tell you about our regulation innovation SIG, which we announced this morning. This is being led by AIR, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, and ING. In fact, you can chat with the SIG leads, Ian Hollibred and David Eric, in our Ask the Expert session uh, just after during the break, just after the, this, the keynotes today. Um, and the goal here is to bring together individuals who are interested in creating open source solutions for regulatory and compliance issues. And we provide a neutral, trusted environment to explore the challenges, identify opportunities, and ultimately build open source projects, standards, tools, models, documentation, reference, reference implementations, really anything that is open but governed that can help. You know, and we recognize that it's important to have representatives and insight from all of the different participants in the industry. So from financial institutions, we need compliance professionals and architects and engineers, and we need regulators at the table too. And you know, there's some great innovative regulators, the FCA, the Bank of England, FINRA, CFPB, who you can hear from later as well. Um, and the tech and advisor community has a huge role to play also. And we need the reg techs, consultants, other foundations, associations. We all need to come together to figure out how we can solve these industry challenges. Um, we had uh, the first, the SIG had its first meeting earlier this week and two items that came up repeatedly were standards and interoperability. You know, we discussed a number of different potential focus areas, Digital regulatory, digital regulatory reporting, AML, horizon scanning, payments. And these discussions often came back to the importance of 
standards and interop. And this really underpinning the ability to be successful in making change. You know, so we had a, a great initial conversation. We have lots of directions for future conversations. And you know, we're really looking forward to, to finding some exciting projects to work on together. Uh, if you want to, you can learn more about the SIG and find out how to get involved on our website um, or on our GitHub repo at finos, uh, github.com, finos open reg tech. And so, We know that this is an, 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 an easy industry challenge to solve. It's hard. It's going to take time and effort of many individuals and many groups. But open source, in all of its variations, must have a prominent role in how we make it faster, better, and easier to produce, interpret, implement, comply with, and supervise financial regulation. Now, this is just one of the big issues we think open source can help solve for the industry, but we do think it's an important one. So with that, I'll wrap up. You know, we, we have many more projects and initiatives, and there are lots of ways that you can get involved, um, you know, whether that's coding or providing insight, so many different opportunities. So please do reach out. You can reach us on Slack, via email, um, lots of different ways. And, and there are a number of sessions today that touch on different angles of regulation and also a number of other topics. So we're, we're um, pretty excited about our lineup today, including our fantastic keynotes. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Chris Ferris. Uh, Chris is an IBM fellow and CTO of Open Technology for IBM. And he's been involved in the architecture, design, and engineering of distributed systems for most of his 40 plus year career in IT. And he's been actively engaged in open standards and open source development since 1999. Uh, today, Chris will talk about the importance of securing the open source supply chain. So please, wel help, um, please welcome Chris Ferris. Hi. My name is Chris Ferris. I'm an IBM fellow and CTO for Open Tech. And I'd like to talk this morning about securing the open source supply chain. So I think we can all agree that it's really critical that you secure the software that you deploy in your enterprise. I don't think anybody disagrees with that particular point. What I'm talking about though this morning is securing the supply chain. Where did all of the open source dependencies that comprise the projects that you're deploying, whether it's Kubernetes or TensorFlow or PyTorch or what have you, where did all of that come from? Who was developing and so forth? Open source is the foundation for almost everything that we do in software these days. And when you think about it, open source projects can have tens, hundreds, even thousands of dependencies upon which they're built. And the, the, the sheer reality is that not all open source software is constructed equally. It's really fundamentally important that you understand where did the software come from? What team was developing it? Do they have security engineering practices in mind? Are they developing it in a community that's going to quickly address any vulnerabilities that might be discovered? You don't wanna be in a situation where basically you have all of this infrastructure deployed on the right-hand side of the screen there. And then this one little tiny dependency that's developed by one guy in Nebraska who gets hit by a bus and nobody understands or, under, or has, uh, is, is even paying attention to, and it, fails in some way and, and brings the whole house of cards tumbling down. And I don't want to get anybody alarmed. This isn't really, you know, something that's that we have to be fundamentally concerned about and stop using open source. That's not my point here. My point is that we really do need to focus on how do we improve the process for developing software with these open source dependencies, ensuring that indeed they're going to be secure uh, as we deploy them. So last fall, there were a number of different threads that sort of started up, um, each sharing a common mission. We were trying to figure out how do we improve the security of the open source software pipeline. So the Linux Foundation had been working on a project called the Core Infrastructure Initiative, some of you may be familiar with, um, but it, it had come to an end in the previous year and uh, Jim Zemlin and others at the Linux Foundation were trying to figure out what do we do with the Core Infrastructure Initiative, its assets and so forth, we, we, we need to sort of continue that program, but in a different form factor. Um, GitHub had gathered together a number of partners 
including OWASP and JP Morgan, Microsoft, Google, NCC Group, and a number of others. And they formed something called the Open Source Security Coalition. And their mission was basically similar. It was to figure out how do we improve the process of developing open source software um, uh, to ensure that it's uh, delivering securely. And then finally, there was another group pulled together by Google, IBM, Microsoft, GitHub, Red Hat, Intel, and the Linux Foundation. Again, focused on just about the same sort of things. But we were doing this all independently and we sort of found out about each other you know, through our, our, our uh, co-mingled members here. And we decided that it would be important that we sort of pull all these things, all these different threads together and launch a single initiative. <clears throat> And so that's where we have uh, launched, uh, as, as of August, the beginning of August, we launched the Open Source Security Foundation. Um, it's been three months now since we've launched and we've accomplished quite a bit and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we're currently a uh, member, there are currently 35 different member organizations of OpenSSF and there are about 110 individuals that are collaborating on the various working groups and uh, technical committees. Um, as you can see from the, the membership, it's a pretty diverse set of uh, members. It's not just uh, software vendors, it's not just hardware vendors, but you know, consumers of technology as well. Um, and, and again, it, we're, we're growing pretty quickly. Again, this is all during the pandemic and so forth. So this is a function of getting the word out. And I would encourage uh, you, uh, you know, to, to think about um, participating in the activities if not becoming a member. It doesn't actually cost anything to be a member this year. Um, because of the pandemic, we figured, look, let's just launch this. Let's, let's make the membership free to all um, and, and let's just grow this and, and see what we can do with it. And we, in fact, are getting some things done. That's the important aspect of this, isn't it? Um, we've launched six different uh, technical working groups to you know, think about you know, various aspects of securing the open source security pipeline, um, identifying security threats. You know, what are the means by which open source can, be can become compromised. Um, so identifying where those security threats are is really a fundamental piece. Security tooling, how do we scan and fuzz uh, test our open source software as it's being developed? Um, and how do we scan images that we're deploying in our enterprise? Let's improve those tools and let's make them available as open source uh, where we can. Um, the best practices is now sort of brought into itself um, the, the work that was ongoing in the core infrastructure initiative um, to improve and publish a set of security best practices for secure engineering and so forth. Um, the vulnerability disclosures group is looking at efficient vulnerability reporting and remediation. Um, we've got a digital identity group that's looking at how do we ensure the provenance of open source code? How do you know that you're using the source code that was actually published by uh, the Kubernetes community, for instance? Um, <clears throat> And then securing critical projects, this is really sort of taking the work that was done in the core infrastructure initiative to take a look at what are the most uh, critical projects to be, um, uh, to be focused on. Again, we can't do all of them, um, but we can maybe look at the top 10 or 20 uh, projects, the ones that are most heavily used, the ones that, you know, if there were a security vulnerability would be uh, the most important to focus on. And we're looking at how can we help those communities improve their secure engineering practices, incorporate scanning and fuzzing in the production of the software and so forth. And then finally, we have a technical advisory council that's looking across all of the different initiatives and we'll be incubating others as they come along um, uh, to uh, you know, sort of keep everything sort of uh, coherent, if you will, um, in, in terms of uh, from a technical, uh, technical perspective. Um, we've accomplished quite a bit in the first three months. We have six working groups, as I mentioned, and a technical advisory council all uh, up and running. We've published a couple of different press releases, including one last week. We had our first town hall meeting just a couple of days ago. Um, the recording will be out on uh, the internet soon. Um, we've had added 16 new member organizations and we have uh, five new governing board members that we've added uh, to the mix. We published our, edX, our first edX course on uh, secure engineering practices. I'll talk about that in a second. And we've, as I mentioned a couple of times, we've started to consolidate some of the output of the core infrastructure initiative. And then finally, there's a, a cool store where you can buy cool swag with the OpenSSF goose uh, on, on the, the front label. Um, I mentioned the edX course. Um, this is something that's free. 
uh, to anybody. If you want to have uh, the certificate, you'll have to pay, but it's free for anybody to take. And I think this is, you know, a really a great opportunity to learn more about secure engineering practices. Um, we're pretty proud of this course. And as I mentioned, we've been working to consolidate the output of um, the uh, core infrastructure initiative, um, including the survey of uh, critical projects, um, uh, another census that was done uh, as, as a function of, okay, so of those projects, which ones are most important to, to have follow-on work? And then uh, we had a, a program called the CII Best Practices Badging Program, um, where you could basically um, uh, have a, a scan of your project to see based on the, 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 the repositories that you're using, are you following secure engineering practices? Um, and then you can get a badge to indicate that indeed you are. Um, and uh, again, this is something that we're going to be continuing to work on as we go forward. I would encourage you to get involved. Again, as I mentioned, it's free to join. Um, and we'd love to have new members, uh, both uh, from a uh, organizational perspective and, uh, but also in terms of the working groups and committees that we have uh, launched to date. Um, there's mailing list meetings are all online and open to anyone to join. Uh, we have Slack, we have Twitter feed. Um, come on down. <laughs> it's really, um, it's starting to really take off and we would encourage everybody to come in because as, as we all know, this is really critically important and nobody's going to secure it for us. We all have to pitch in and help to secure the software they're deploying. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Take care. Um, now I'd like to introduce our next two speakers, Joanne Barefoot and Matthew Van Buskirk, who will be discussing the future of financial regulation. And uh, Matt is the co-founder and CEO of Hummingbird RegTech. Hummingbird is giving superpowers to the people fighting financial crime. And they're doing this by reducing paperwork, providing smart, data-rich analytics, and enabling collaboration for compliance professionals and law enforcement agencies. And Joanne is CEO and founder of AIR, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation. And she's also the host of global podcast, Barefoot Innovation, which I listen to regularly. Um, she's a noted advocate of regulation innovation and has incredible industry experience, including previous roles as deputy controller of the currency, staff member at the US Senate Banking Committee, committee and as co-founder of Hummingbird RegTech. And among many of her other current roles, she's also serving on the FinTech Advisory Committee for FINRA. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So please welcome Joanne and Matt. Greetings, everyone. I'm Joanne Barefoot. I am CEO and co-founder of the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, or AIR. We are a nonprofit dedicated to digitizing the financial regulatory world. And I'm happy to be joined in this fireside chat with Matt Van Buskirk, the co-CEO of Hummingbird, who is also an advisor to us at AIR on technology in general and especially on open source. So Matt, welcome to this conversation. Looking forward to it. We are going to make it a two-way conversation. We actually talk about these issues all the time, so we're just going to have that conversation to share with the group today. So when we think about bringing open source to the financial regulatory space, a lot is at stake. The financial system is the circulatory system of the economy. If it doesn't work well, bad things happen. If it works really well, some really good things can happen in today's technology world that weren't possible in the, in the past. But if we're not careful, uh, the regulatory aspect of this, since it's such a highly regulated section, it'll choke off good innovation that we would all like to see accidentally. And it will also uh, potentially allow new risks to come into the system. And the regulatory system needs new tools for the digital age and the pandemic in particular has really uh, accelerated the recognition of that and the readiness to adopt it. 
So Matt, let me start by asking you, where does open source fit into that challenge? I'd like to draw parallels to the uh, tech world when we're thinking about where the regulatory kind of situation is today and where we would like it to go. Uh, it's basically like the tech world was back in the 1990s with a bunch of different uh, providers sort of building their own closed ecosystems, whether that's the Microsoft versus Apple uh, comparison or the sort of fragmentation we saw in the internet space with AOL and CompuServe and all these other solutions that didn't really uh, speak with each other at all. Um, that's basically where we are today in the regulatory world from a technology perspective. And in some cases, the technology that's being used actually does come from the 1990s kind of vintage, uh, maybe even older in some cases. So the revolution we've seen in the software space moving towards more interoperability, more reliance on shared protocols and standards, uh, more open source code bases uh, is non-existent really in the regulatory world. and uh, there, I think it presents a major challenge to innovation widely in financial services. Um, as we've seen sort of FinTech uh, expand and uh, the banking industry try to adopt more uh, sophisticated technology, we're still regulating using the same approaches and tools that we did 20 years ago. And it's going to continue to, it'll become a bigger and bigger uh, anchor weighing down innovation unless we can move to a new footing uh, using the sim same themes I was just talking about in the regulatory space as well. Um, so we could really unlock innovation to a degree that we have not seen before if we can start to think about regulation as more of a open source software challenge as opposed to uh, sort of lawyers and papers and spreadsheets. Yeah. And this thinking is quite new in the regulatory space. We do have some financial regulatory agencies that are using open source techniques. The, in the United States, the financial, uh, or in the UK, the Financial Conduct Authority has done this. In the United States, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, has open sourced some of its work. But regulators still tend to react to the thought of open source as sounding insecure and risky. So there's a lot of education and part of what we're trying to do today is to uh, offer a, a issue a call to action uh, for the people in this virtual room to do more. But there are tremendous potential benefits to regulators and some of them are just what this audience already knows about open source. But part of it is uh, that regulators today reinvent the wheel every time they need to develop something. We could tell you horror stories about agencies spending tens of millions of dollars to create some new uh, platform for doing their work, that type of thing, completely inside their own silo when there's maybe already a better one at a sister agency that they don't even know about. So you could get beyond reinventing the wheel. You could get the benefit of regulators being able to build on each other's work. You could get the benefit of scrutiny from the open source community on these tools to find the, the uh, bugs and the weaknesses and the vulnerable spots in them and get those fixed quickly. You can get the ability to constantly uh, improve, con continuously update and build these tools out. Much of the financial system and certainly the financial regulatory system is, is half paralyzed with rigid old technologies, as you said, that are really hard to update. Um, and you can also build interoperability of the regulatory system, which would foster in interoperability of the financial system, which would be very beneficial, especially to international financial organizations. And you can also get the benefit of regulatory agencies being able, in, to some extent, to get away from their procurement processes for technology, which are very cumbersome and difficult um, and inflexible, and let them start to be able to build tools just by finding the open source um, material for it and, and be able to move in a much more adaptable way. So toward that end, one of the exciting things that I want to talk about today is that we at AIR 
are partnering with Finos and creating a special interest group, a SIG on RegTech in the um, uh, in the Linux ecosystem. We want to invite all of you to join in that. We're just at the very start of it. I think it's going to be a very exciting opportunity. But Matt, let me ask you what you think are the obstacles to being able to bring open source approaches into the financial regulatory space? Well, you touched on some on the regulatory side. The existing procurement processes are one of the biggest barriers. One of the agencies that we've uh, met with in the past, which I will not name, said that if they wanted to get their hands on a new uh, piece of technology, it would probably take them seven years from kicking the process off to when they would actually have it deployed. I remember that meeting. <laughs> yeah. If you think about how... Uh, it would be no good anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It would be way out of date. Um, so there are all sorts of structural barriers that the regulators face. And another challenge is that since they're typically forced to go through normal procurement processes, the companies that are often the best at navigating procurement, uh, the procurement world in government are rarely the ones that are the most cutting edge on technology. Um, so there've been multiple instances we've seen in the past where a contractor gets deal, deploys technology, and it's already many years out of date by the time it's deployed. Um, and probably cost five or 10 times more than it would need to if they had taken a more open source development uh, model. So uh, there are a variety of legal and structural impediments that the regulators face. Uh, the uh, AIR, the Alliance for Favorite Regulation and the Buckley Law Firm released a memo or report earlier this year, which was uh, analyzing several of those barriers, uh, which if uh, adjusted slightly could enable the regulators to adopt this approach more readily. Um, but another, I think, is a uh, challenge they face is that the regulatory agencies themselves are used to needing to be authoritative and fully understanding of uh, all the risks and opportunities presented by something before they come out and uh, make their view publicly known. And that typically involves them sitting back for two or three years and studying something but they don't have the in-house expertise to understand this technology for the most part, with some notable exceptions. And uh, they don't, the process inherently doesn't lend itself to stay on top of things as they evolve. So the lack of exposure and uh, lack of in-house expertise, or at least enough in-house expertise is one of the biggest barriers. And I, th I think that's one of the largest opportunities presented by uh, the open source community here. Um, I think one major learning I've had as a, I'm a former regulator, uh, but a, a techie at heart, uh, there are not too many people in the regulatory world have a full understanding of what uh, the cutting edge capabilities in the tech world are. And if you go to a technologist and tell them about or speak about the regulatory world, they probably would be falling asleep immediately uh, without realizing that there are some very meaningful and impactful challenges uh, that could really benefit from bringing their talents to bear. So we really need to be able to cross-pollinate, uh, have people understand regulation, getting in the same room with people understand the technology and start to develop uh, common approaches to things. And uh, I strongly believe the most effective way to do that is through open source uh, development mechanisms and putting projects out on GitHub for people to contribute to and start to build a community that can brainstorm solutions to these very meaningful challenges that we face. And um, there will, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So there will be uh, areas where certainly regulators will need to keep their data uh, not shared, although there'll be some places where it'd be good for, for them to share data so that uh, for example, companies in the industry can benchmark themselves against uh, other information or trends and that type of thing. Uh, but your view is that there's not too much reason to fear that putting methodologies into open source uh, will compromise them. There's a lot of, you, you do a lot of work in financial crime at Hummingbird, and there's certainly a concern raised that if if regulators were open sourcing their techniques, 
for detecting financial crime that the criminals would all uh, go figure out how to how to game it. What's your answer to that? That's sort of the same response to the information security angle on open source, where there's sort of a common uh, stereotypical view that open source means open data. In reality, it's sort of the uh, the eyeballs comparison question, like how many people are looking for vulnerabilities versus how many people are looking for uh, vulnerabilities to exploit versus how many are looking for them to protect against them. That holds true very significantly in the any money laundering world as well, where the criminal world are not, they're not uh, hiding information from each other. And there's been the advent of a concept of crime as a service where people are developing tools and finding vulnerabilities in financial services providers. And they're often not exploiting them themselves. They're, they're building those tools and then selling them or licensing, licensing them to other criminal people. Uh, so you have a average level of sophistication in these tools that keeps getting better and better. But on the financial industry side of uh, the table, we're often combating these bad actors by going to conferences once a year and learning what the latest developments are. So best case scenario there, you may learn about a new approach a year plus after it's been commonly deployed. Um, so the there's an equivalent challenge there where I would argue that if we were developing capabilities and uh, that were much more sophisticated and robust and uh, even if they were visible to the criminal world, it wouldn't be any different than it is today where they're freely sharing information amongst themselves. But every financial institution in out there, regardless of whether they are a major bank with thousands of people doing this work or a community bank that may only be able to put half of a full-time person onto it, they could all uh, coordinate uh, and defend themselves more effectively and it would um, even the playing field significantly. So I think there's yeah. a lot of parallels to there. There's, there are shocking uh, statistics from the UN uh, saying that the volume of money laundering annually is somewhere around $2 trillion and that we catch less than 1% of it with the tools we have now. So we're gonna to have to have better tools if we're gonna combat crimes, for example, like human trafficking that rely on laundered money. So I know we're gonna run short on time. We wanna share with the audience some, some things we wanna urge you to do because this is a revolution that's coming. It, we think it may be coming faster than people think. There's a lot of energy globally gathering around really transforming the financial regulatory space. So for the, the people in this room who may be working for their major financial company on, uh, on the product side, what should they do if they want to get involved in helping their company do better on the compliance side with open source tools? I think part of it is just uh, educating the getting involved with the compliance team and letting them know what could be done. Compliance teams very rarely actually have engineering resources that they can bring to bear on the challenges that they face. So they don't know what could be done. Um, so it's getting interested in your uh, compliance team's work. Uh, obviously there's sort of a stereotypical view of compliance that they're the people uh, that say no to all of your good ideas. Uh, but in, most cases, hopefully, those it's just because they may not understand fully the opportunities or the risks presented by adopting new tech. And uh, investing technical effort into your compliance function could really unlock a lot of potential for you to do other things that are consumer facing. Um, so that's one piece of it. I think another would be uh, participating in the the SIG and with nonprofits like AIR and the uh, Finos that are trying to bring collaborative efforts to bear on this. Those are, uh, are there other issues you would highlight? I think one thing that would be a good practical step would be as you talk with your compliance teams about this, uh, talk with their examiners as well, if, especially if you're a bank. Um, and uh, let them know that you're, that you're thinking about doing some work along these lines and, and bring them along because 
the, the, Matt and I are both former regulators, and we know we don't we're not criticizing the regulators. They're, they've been doing the best they can with the technology they've had, but getting that that community comfortable with newer technology is is a learning process, and we need to engage in it together. And maybe to close, just to say that working with this effort, as Matt said, there's a stereotype that regulatory work is boring and uh, you know box checking and bureaucratic, and that's really not true. There are very interesting problems in this space. There are problems that nobody has touched yet with good technology and uh, that you could really have major impact. And the good that it can do, if you want to fight credit discrimination or you want to fight trafficking in children or you want to figure out sustainable finance uh, because you care about climate change. I mean, these are the big issues on the regulatory agenda and these kinds of tools are going to be the secret to doing it. So we hope you'll work with the new SIG and, um, and, and go back to your offices and, or virtually go back and uh, talk with your regulatory teams about how to bring open source innovation into this very important sector. So thank you, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne and Matt, so much. And you know, if you have any questions or want to pick up the conversation, please do join the Slack channel on, on regulation as well. Um, now, it is my absolute pleasure to announce our last keynote session, a discussion between co-author of the CREACT, CREATE REACT app, Dan Abramoff, and Finos's Director of Community, James McLeod. Uh, Dan is a well-known software engineer at Facebook and a member of the React core team. And prior to joining Facebook, Dan co-authored Redux, a predictable state container for JavaScript applications. And, and this really catapulted Dan to be an influential conference speaker and successful Twitter commentator. And I know that James has really been looking forward to this conversation. So please welcome Dan Abramoff and James McLeod. Hi, I'm James McLeod, Finos Director of Community, and I'd like to welcome Dan Abramoff, software engineer at Facebook, co-author of Create React App and Redux, and Twitter open source commentator to the Finos Open Source Strategy Forum. Dan, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today to answer questions from the Finos community. But before we start, can you introduce yourself for those who aren't familiar with the work you do within the wider JavaScript or Facebook open source community? Sure. Uh, th thank you for the introduction. So I, um, I guess I'm only uh, I mostly work on React itself. So React is a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. Um, so I I was like using React a lot before I got the job at Facebook, and I work on the React core team. So that involves mostly. Uh, Fixing bugs, maintenance, uh, helping develop new features, writing documentation, and talking to the community, which is what I'm doing now. That's awesome. So firstly, what are your th thoughts on the funding of open source projects and sustainability? Would a project like React work without the backing from Facebook? Yeah, that's, uh, that, that is an interesting question. Um, I think there is... Uh, um, it is definitely possible that projects uh, like work without uh, like a specific, like a single corporate. I mean, obviously they do need some sponsors, right? And like usually those would be corporate. Um, but like, I think like Vue is a, uh, th there is a um, kind of like a, a competing library called Vue that is uh, fairly popular. And Vue doesn't have a single corporate sponsor. So it's, uh, it's multiple sponsors, they change over time. Um, so it, it is funded by, by the community and the, and the users. So I think it's, it's definitely true that this model can be successful. It's, it's not very easy to like replicate it. You need a critical mass of users. So I think it mostly works for already established like pretty big projects, uh, but it is, uh, it is definitely possible. As for React itself, I think there is a, um, like, 
it's, it's hard to say like what if like i don't know uh, i think there is a um there are definitely differences in like how we would work um and i think like one particular area that i think people um underestimate the value of uh of like a company that is uh, that is stable that uh that that is not like a startup but like a um a stable corporate sponsor is the ability to do long-term research so um because for for a lot of uh, at least in my experience and like I, i'm not like uh, <laughs> i don't want to offend anyone but uh i think it, it is true that when uh like for smaller companies the return on investment is uh, like it needs to be very concrete uh like it's it's support it's developing like particular features that they ask for um and while that that by itself is obviously valuable and that that's fine um i think sometimes this uh this comes at the expense of um like not being able to do kind of moonshot projects where like you might uh or whereas like a bigger company might be able to fund like uh, three years working on some idea that is um, that is maybe more ambitious than usual, and not all of them pan out. And I think that is, that is what I, I, I appreciate about Fa Facebook backend React is that we have the ability to go for like really big ideas, even if they take time. So from what I understand, when you're developing Redux, you had to get multiple different sponsors in order to keep your work going. Um, is that true? Um, so Redux was, uh, it was kind of a uh, unusual case because it is, it was developed as a proof of concept for a conference talk. It was not meant to be this like heavily used library in production, uh, but people started using it. They liked it. And then for a few months, uh, like I, I didn't have a job at the time because like my previous, uh, the company when I, where I was working, it, it has folded. Um, and so I did, um, I did have the community funded for like maybe three to five months, something like this. Uh, but I was primarily focused on documentation and, uh, and like examples. So I was not even coding that much. And I would say that Redux hasn't really changed since like that, that was like five, four or five years ago. Like it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very unusual library in that it doesn't really do anything. Uh, and it's just like a, a pattern. And I would say like even like maybe an overused uh, pattern. Um, but it, it is what it is. Yeah, it certainly has its competitors now. And so you've sparked some in inspiration in the rest of the open source community with it. So um, last month, I actually noticed that there were various different tweets about um, Hacktoberfest and, you know, the value that Hacktoberfest actually brings to the open source community and the, the value of the contributions. Um, now Hacktoberfest has ended. Did the React team actually see an uplift in bogus contributions or did DigitalOcean address the community concerns? Yeah, I, I think it, it was a complete mess in the beginning. And in part, I, I think... That, like the, from what I gathered, it was just like that there was a person, like a YouTube uh, person who like uploaded the video that said basically, here's how you can get like free t-shirts. And so people got carried away. I don't think like a lot of them were even familiar with like open source. Um, so that, that, that was a bit strange, uh, but that lasted for like three or four days. And then uh, I think like digital uh, ocean changed it to be opt-in or something like this. Uh, we did not opt-in. Um, so it's, it's hard for me to say if like, aside from those early uh, like noisy PRs, if there was like actual uptick in contributions, uh, but that's mostly because it's just like, I'm, I'm doing a pretty bad job of like actually checking those. Uh, because we're like we're in a um, kind of a final stretch of like a few multi-year projects that we're just trying to wrap up uh, and get to completion, and so we have intentionally de-emphasized uh, like looking at contributions and um, uh, and like uh, community 
pull requests. So I haven't really been keeping track and like, I don't expect to you until like several months after now. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I suppose um, the React team would have to label um, some of the issues that they're inviting out to the Hacktoberfest community. And so it kind of puts a bit of um, pressure on the team to um, review and then accept. Yeah, and I think for, especially for React's case, uh, it's pretty tough because like, it's not a new project. There aren't many, uh, you know, like simple bugs you can just go ahead and fix. Um, so it's uh, like, there are issues we do want to work out, but they require like multiple months of like just gaining context on like what the problem is. So it's not particularly like amenable to uh, just like drive by contributions. Yeah. Uh, whereas, and I think like that's that's fine. I think like a lot of people who think about oh like I want to contribute to open source, like they think about big projects, but it's really like I would encourage to go beyond them and instead just like fix something that you use. It's often like small components, small libraries that would appreciate the, uh, you know, like the actual like, like bug fixes and the, like there's plenty like uh, opportunities for like performance improvements and, and stuff. Um, so I would say just fo focus on the, uh, you know, on the uh, long tail, uh, not on the, uh, like like on the, on the uh, just if you high, highly visible projects. Absolutely, I know. Um, from a financial services point of view, um, having React be an open source, it means that you know uh, engineering leads can actually take a look under the hood at the code that's there, and so it gives you reassurance about the quality of the product rather than you know the odds of you being able to contribute into the project. Um, so from that point of view, you know, open source, you know, does increase quality and it keeps the engineers accountable for the work they're doing. Um, so if people actually follow you on Twitter and you know, uh, look at all of the tutorials that you've been putting online, you actually spend a lot of time on community engagement. Would you say that's essential for project su success and what works best for building that community? Um. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I don't actually do as much of that now. And it's kind of a tough balance. Like, I wish I, I had a good answer, but like, I'm just learning. Um, because I think like early on, uh, it really helped uh, React that uh, there was a, uh, like, I, th I think React in that sense was unusual because uh, like usually you would have dedicated people like developer advocates uh, actually uh, um, like helping people understand the project and like documenting and so on. And I think React from like, from ver very intentionally from early days, it was like most of that work was done by engineers working on it. Um, and so the downside of this is that uh, you, um, so the upside of this is that it's uh, like the vision uh, of the the people promoting the product is this like it it is guaranteed to be the same as the vision of the people actually like working on it. So there is no like chance of miscommunication or like framing something that is like not entirely correct. Uh, so it, it is very uh, like it is very honest. Uh, but the, the downside of that is that um, as, as the project grows, it doesn't really scale. So like you can't keep responding to everyone. And also I think like one thing that, that I'm kind of uh, trying to figure out now is like, I think uh, like a few team members, like including myself become kind of the center of attention where like all this energy is concentrated. And that actually makes it harder for like newer people to break out into the like into the ecosystem because um, like they're not the ones being asked questions like they don't get the same opportunities and so it becomes this very top down structure uh, even like unintentionally um, and I think that that's something that uh, like that's why I feel like like I don't really have advice because like I, I want to figure out how to uh, like decentralize it a little bit and maybe not not have to be as involved. 
Yeah, actually, that is a, a really good, well, th that's an unintentional consequence of, you know, that momentum that your own personal brand has built. Um, so how do you actually invite um, other engineers from, you know, the open source community or Facebook into that? You know, how do you delegate, you know, all of that focus that you have outwards so it becomes more federated and less centralized? Yeah, and like I feel like some teams are better at this uh, than us. Like I think Vue team is a good example. Uh, like they, even though there is a, a small kind of um, like the project itself is driven by a uh, a small number of people, they do a pretty good job at distributing knowledge. Even like um, things that do that are top down. Like there is uh, there is a particular like direction that the team wants to to take. Um, they do kind of find ways to uh, distribute it across uh, like educators and, and like so that it's, it doesn't seem like it's coming from like just a single source. So I think that that, uh, that helps. Um, but uh, another part of this is just um, better documentation for sure. Like uh, because like the reason people ask me questions is just because like something's not plainly stated in the docs. Um, and that's like also partially like like our fault because uh, for some things like for example like uh, React hooks, right? Like it's a it's a uh, it's a pretty big shift in how you think about React components. Uh, it's like a new API we introduced uh, two years ago. Almost I think it's almost two years ago by now. Um, and actually a bit over two years. Um, and it's like at the time we didn't know how to use them. Like, sure, we wrote the docs, but like we didn't have two years of ex like nobody had the experience. It's a novel concept. It's like nobody like wrote code quite the same way before. And so, of course, we didn't document a lot of things, and we're just because we are just finding them out, and like we are finding them out through those conversations and through those questions. Yeah. But it's it's like, you know, you need to take time to kind of gather things and then you need to like consolidate them. And I think that's that's the phase we're in now is like we've learned all of those things from those conversations. And now we need to put them in a like in a reference so that other people can refer to them without asking us. Yeah. So we were talking about um, federation versus centralization. So with um, React Hooks being an example, did the requirements or the idea for that come from the community or did it come from the React team? Yeah, um, it's an interesting question. I think it's uh, like there is a broader question here of like the where does the direction of React come from? I think it's, it's actually something that is quite misunderstood uh, in the community. Uh, so, like, there there are people who think that like Facebook sets uh, the direction of React, uh, and I think like maybe we have said something to that point that like that's the reason people are saying that is that we we have miscommunicated earlier. Um, uh, but I, I think it's it's really neither. It's uh, it's neither Facebook nor the open source community. Um, I think the so like um, the, the, the way I see it happening is that we, um, we look at different problems and like people bring problems to us, right? So, and that happens both at Facebook and externally. And like, there are different characteristics of like how that happens. So like um, externally, we get a larger volume of problems, but slightly lower quality because the barrier like to, to like file an issue so low that people can just like fix my code. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, you don't like the signal to noise ratio is, is not very effective, uh, but the volume is so large that you pick up on, like you notice things that you wouldn't like have, you wouldn't have thought of otherwise uh, that like people run into. So that gives you breadth. And then I think at Facebook, it's more about depth. So at Facebook, we also, like people also come to us with problems and we can spend much longer time 
kind of because like we have access to the product we don't just take their word for it that it's a problem we can like literally run that code and see oh like i see what they're saying i see how that influences the product um so we get a lot of uh, uh, like much more depth from those conversations and th those investigations um but the solutions don't come from that either like that's just inputs and um I can't really say where solutions come from because like I'm not <laughs> the primary person who comes up with them. Yeah. Uh, it's mostly like Sebastian or Jack Lead. Um, but the way he works is more like a scientist in the sense that uh, he accumulates all these problems, but then he kind of takes, you know, like how you need to take a step back and see like how, how like how, how did we how did we end up in this situation and like what what are the different things we could do? Um, but I think what what is unique about Sebastian from like my perspective, like compared to people I work with, is that he takes like ten steps back or like fifteen steps back, and he he discovers like pathways that like other people didn't take for whatever reason uh, that are actually like pretty interesting and. So, and like, I think his, his thinking is shaped by first principles, which means that like, it's not about Facebook, not about open source. It's about what is a user interface? Uh, how does a computer work? <laughs> how do we make those things <laughs> work together? And it, it sounds really vague, but uh, I think like, right. he, he finds those solutions and he's inspired, like obviously he takes a lot of inspiration from things happening elsewhere, right? Um, so it could be like comp competitor frameworks, but also again, like his, uh, like he looks at uh, like things in programming language research or like low level graphics or like all of those things that he would usually not necessarily connect to front end, but like he finds inspiration there as well. And I think it's just this work, like the way he comes up with solutions is just this synthesis of different things that he learned from like different places. That's um, an amazing observation because it's very easy to get caught in, you know, delivering features or doing what a business analyst asks you to do, you know, and, you know, computer science is actually very creative and it's a good opportunity to go back to the science and explore, you know, our roots and what we need to do in order to further things. So within financial services, um, inner source is actually a really big um, uh, topic. And that's all about the collaboration inside teams and inside um, firewalls before you even get to open source. So what is the strategy at Facebook regarding inner sourcing and open sourcing projects? How does each team decide which project to open source? Yeah, um, I think this really comes down to individual engineers. Um, because like you can't force somebody to open source a project. And I think uh, projects that have been open source have always had somebody who like felt really passionate about it and kind of convinced uh, like other people that it's, uh, it's the right thing to do. But then even if you open source it, right, there's like, um, there's different ways to do it. And um, a lot of teams like they might open source something and then they don't know well, they just threw something over the wall, but they don't work with the community or they um, like they don't really explain uh, what it is or they stop maintaining it. So like in that case, it's, it's, it's better not to open source than to open source poorly um, because that, that just creates like a burden for your users or you need to be very clear in expectations. So we do have a process, like we have a, open source team that supports open source efforts um, that is there. Like if you want to open source something, you send them a request and they like follow up with you just to check that you understand that like open source is a commitment, uh, that like it's it's not just throwing things over the wall. Um, like what this thing is, how is it different from what we already open sourced because like we have a large portfolio of projects. Um, and we also, they like they have a stage process so we start in like uh, something called like Facebook Incubator, which is just a home to like all exper and I think like Facebook Experimental, maybe that's what it's called, but it's like a home to all the projects that we don't really know if like they're going to work out as open source. 
And then if there is like, if there is adoption and the team is still interested, like eventually they kind of graduate. Um, but there are plenty, uh, there are plenty of libraries and solutions that um, like the authors are just not interested or they just feel that they bring more value to the company by focusing on, uh, on like internal integrations. And so they, they explicitly decide against open sourcing. Um, and I think like th that's also a that that's also a way of doing things. Um, I, I think just my kind of mantra there is just that it it's better not to open source than to open source poorly. So you you need to really know like why you're doing it and what what you're hoping to get from it because uh, like you're probably not gonna get contributions. Like that's that's not the. Uh, I think like a lot of people think that they uh, that's like oh Facebook is getting so many contributions that's why they open source. Uh, for React we actually get sure we have a lot of small contributions, but uh, the vast majority of the work is done by uh, like folks uh, employed at Facebook or our partners like companies that we partner with. Um, it's it's not like just like drive by fixes. Uh, that are like uh, really making the big difference. So open source is not about like getting something. It's more about like, if you feel that you want to influence the industry, you want to share what you learned and you want to put your approach under the scrutiny. Uh, like I think that that's one of the most positive things about big company open source is that it keeps you honest uh, because internally it's easy to stagnate. There's like, there's a solution, everyone uses it too hard to migrate away from, and it just, uh, it's just like, uh, it just dom dominates within the company because there's nothing better. Uh, but in the open source, you're forced to confront that there are other solutions and they have different characteristics and now you have to compete. And so that makes your product better because you have those like uh, abstraction boundaries uh, that, that, that you can check that those actually make sense. Yeah. Um, so I think that it's, it's, it's a good like self check if your code is actually like good. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you very much for that advice. Um, so the final question, so taking a look at your own um, personal projects uh, within your own um, personal uh, repo, we noticed that you have a project there called, um, so this is the acronym. So I know that it's not actually called this, but it's um, called by some wider name, but WTF is. So, so what is that and, and what's the motivation behind it? Yeah, so um, it's kind of like a side project. I actually forgot about it. So I, <laughs> I need to add a few, a few more definitions, but it's, uh, it's a glossary of, uh, of like terms you might encounter in JavaScript, um, like closure, hydration, uh, you know, like things that sound like uh, some of the compu uh, computer science concepts, like memoization. Uh, some of them are just like uh, some tooling or uh, like just concepts that don't really make sense, but that people kind of uh, like that made their way into JavaScript developer vocabulary. Um, but the point of that glossary was I, I just couldn't find anything quite like if I wanted to explain like one of those words to somebody, I couldn't find like a place to link them to because uh, Wikipedia is just impossible to read. It's like uh, on computer science, if you open something, it's just, I, I don't know. There's, they assume so much existing knowledge and like existing context and like uh, they're overcomplicating things. And then if you, if you just search for like, like simple definitions uh, on like blogs and articles. A lot of them are plain wrong or misleading. Uh, like the person misunderstood something and then and then like wrote an article about it. That's super common. And I mean, like I, 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 I can fall to the same thing as well. Hopefully because like my material gets a lot of circulation, people will point out the mistakes. Um, so but I yeah, suppose... that's, that's kind of the motivation is just to have something that is worth it in the way I would explain a concept to someone over lunch. Yeah, yeah. And what, what I was thinking, so earlier in the interview, you said people should actually be contributing to the smaller libraries and the more long tail kind of solutions. 
And so this could actually be a perfect, um, you know, project for people within the Finos community to raise pull requests against, to help you maybe flesh it out. Yeah, I, I don't think this one is a good example because uh, it is also intentionally, uh, um, it has a very kind of uh, um, uh, well-defined voice. So it's it's like my writing. It is very intentionally, right. um, I, I don't think like uh, anyone would write in exactly the same way. And like, I, I want it to be written with my particular voice. That, that's yes. kind of like, an aspect of this project, but similar projects, sure, like they, they would, sure, and like, especially because people don't contribute as much to, like they want to contribute code, they don't want to like contribute documentation as much, but that's actually like documentation is one of the things that uh, can be like really, really difficult, especially writing good one. Um, so, so, so maybe one way people could actually help you is by raising an issue, you know, something that they found that you might want to consider for inclusion yeah. in, in the glossary. For sure, yeah. That's awesome. So thank you, Dan, for joining me today. But before we leave, how can people follow the work that you're doing in the open source community and potentially leverage it for their own projects? Mm. Yeah, uh, I... I, I don't I don't know because uh, I I have a Twitter but I I mostly just like uh, post random things there um, in part because like uh, especially lately I feel like Twitter has gotten so uh, like I mean technical Twitter has gotten very kind of polarized uh, in terms of like oh like this library like is bad this library is like what it's it's just it's very emotionally taxing. So I kind of stepped away from like technical discussions on Twitter. Um, and I prefer to have them on GitHub. So, but if, I think like if we release anything important, like if you're interested in React, just follow the React.js Twitter account. That's uh, anything important will be there for sure. And on the React.js blog. So again, like we post anything that's on the blog that's gonna be cross posted on Twitter. Uh, so you can follow React.js. As for my personal work, uh, you can definitely follow me like uh, twitter.com slash Dan underscore Abramov. Um, but just be prepared that it's a lot of random stuff. And then somewhere in the middle, maybe I post something about a project I work on. That's amazing. Thank you once again, Dan, for joining us today. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, James and Dan. And thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, I do hope you all enjoy the rest of today's session. And we look forward to seeing you back at 2.35 for a wrap up and our awards announcements. Have a great day.